welcome to the Bowen Center tonight for the Thursday professional meeting. I'm not supposed to say Thursday because once a year we do it on Wednesday, <laughs> but please know it's a bad habit. Um, this is a professional lecture series where we have a variety of speakers once a month for the academic year. And anybody's welcome, and so bring your friends next time. Um, I'm Ann Gordon Curran. I'm from Richmond, but I've been attending these meetings for a number of years, and so this is how I became unemployed here. <laughs> the topic tonight, why bishops only move diagonally, systems leadership lessons from the church. I have been curious about what is behind this title. The Right Reverend Stacy F. Sauls has extensive experience over many years of ministry, and he was a learner of systems thinking under Rabbi Edwin Friedman. Bishop Saul's first career was in law. He completed undergraduate school at Furman University in Greenville, South Carolina, and his law degree from the University of Virginia. <coughs> he worked as a corporate lawyer, most notably with Delta Airlines. In the mid-1980s, he attended and graduated from General Theological Seminary in New York and was ordained an Episcopal priest in 1989. After serving churches in Atlanta and Savannah, Georgia, he was elected and consecrated to be the sixth Bishop of Lexington in Kentucky. Bishop Sauls has been able to use his two professions as resources in his various jobs and chosen paths on his journey. He is a member of the State Bar of Georgia, the District of Columbia Bar, and the Ecclesiastical Law Society, which is in the United Kingdom. General Theological Seminary presented him with the Doctor of Divinity Honors Causa in 2001, as did the University of the South, Swanee, in 2002. He earned a master's degree in canon law, which is the law of the Episcopal Church, from Cardiff University in 2009. In 2011, he was employed by the Domestic and Foreign Missionary Society of the Episcopal Church as COO until spring of 2016. Following that experience, Bishop Sauls has begun a program called Love Must Act, which he serves as Chief Executive Officer. This project builds partnerships between communities in North America and communities overseas, which in turn build schools with a holistic approach to the education of children, spiritually, socially, and physically. His passion is edu educating children and transforming lives through relationships. Bishop Sauls is married and has two grown sons. Let us welcome Bishop Sauls. Thank you, Anne. Thanks, everyone. Um, the um, couple of disclaimers um, <laughs> about technology. One is I, I'm trying something I've never done before, which is to use notes that are on my computer instead of hard copy, so anyway, we'll see how that goes. I'm nervous about it. Second, I um, got a very kind note today about technology. I was gonna need to uh, audio-visual kinds of support, and I, I don't need any at all. <laughs> I need lots, but I don't have anything to show you. Um, the, I, I started to go uh, to opt for entertainment, and I, I had some ideas, but um, I don't have any, any of that, so I, what my plan is uh, to share some ideas with you about uh, leadership issues in the church, and as Anne said, why bishops only move diagonally, and uh, and then I hope, but what I really hope is uh, that that will lead to some conversation conversation among us, because that uh, is certainly going to be a lot more interesting to me. The um, what and another reason I want to do that is I, I noticed two things after becoming a bishop that were interesting. One is I could take regular people and turn them into priests. And second, I have acquired the ability to talk forever. So I'm gonna to try to be careful about that. But, um, but I do have a number of ideas I wanted to share with you. I also, also by way of disclaimer, wanna to, want to say um, that I've never been more nervous about talking to a group than I am about this one. Um, the uh, This is a group of really smart people who think uh, really, uh, in a very disciplined way about things that, that I'm very interested in, but I'm no expert in. Um, nevertheless, here I am speaking to you about them, and I am, am looking forward to the things I'm going to learn from that. So I'm really honored to be here, and I appreciate you being here. 
and um, we'll, I'll just jump in if that's okay. I want to begin <clears throat> by telling you that when I was thinking about going to seminary now, many years ago, uh, part of that process was I had a number of conversations with my parish priest in Atlanta. Now, as is typical, I hardly remember any of those conversations. <laughs> but I remember one little part of one of those conversations. We were discussing the qualities that it took to be a good parish priest. And of course, I found myself asking if I had all the qualities that it would take to be one of those. And I remember him saying to me, you know, there just aren't enough people who go into priesthood with the killer instinct. <laughs> I didn't laugh. That's I was sort of horrified. <laughs> um, I thought it was quite a curious thing to say, and I, I wasn't sure that I had the killer instinct. And, and more than that, I wasn't sure that I wanted to have the killer instinct. Um, <coughs> still, um, I now know <coughs> that what he meant was that priests and bishops who have the courage not to move diagonally and who face things head on and directly are few and far between. There are far too few of them, I think, and I fear that they're getting to be fewer and fewer. So while I'm talking about killer instincts, allow me to begin by talking about the military. I came through the Atlanta airport this past Sunday morning on my way home from South Africa, where I had been working with the Anglican Church to build what they call pro-poor schools. And I heard a public service announcement that I'd heard many times before, and I'm sure you've heard it too, but may not have paid attention to it. It was to the effect that the Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport welcomes and thanks the members of the military for their service. And then it went on to whatever the, the talk about Atlanta being in the Eastern time zone. Now, I don't remember the exact words, but, but you get the picture and you probably heard it. If I had audio visual support right now, I would show you a picture of troops passing through the Atlanta airport. And uh, you go look on YouTube, you can see it on your own time. And everybody stands and cheers. And then the fascinating thing to me is as soon as the troops pass by, they go back to doing whatever they were doing before as if none of that had ever happened. And I'm going to talk some more about that. Um, I paid attention, though, to that public service announcement this time because I had just read a fascinating article on the plane from a two-year-old issue of the Atlantic, which had been given to me by a friend who is a monk and a former non-commissioned officer in the Namibian army. The title of the article from the January-February 2015 issue is The Tragedy of the American Military by James Fallows. The lead into the article is this. The American public and its political leadership will do anything for the military except take it seriously. The result is a chicken hawk nation in which careless spending and strategic folly combine to lure America into endless wars it cannot win. Fallow's point is that the American public is dangerously disconnected from its military. And I think his observations have a lot to do with why bishops only move diagonally. Let me explain. Fallow spends a fair amount of time on what he calls the emptiness of these modern thank you for your service rituals, like the airport announcement. He poignantly describes a novel I have not read yet called Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk by Ben Fountain. It is about an army squad that had seen some devastating action in Iraq and is brought home to be honored at the halftime show of the Thanksgiving Day Dallas Cowboys game, America's team. While there, the troops are, in Fallow's words, slapped on the back and toasted by <laughs> owner's box moguls and flirted with by cheerleaders, passed around like everyone's favorite bomb, as platoon member Billy Lynn thinks of it, 
and are then shipped right back to the front. The people at the stadium feel good about what they've done to show their support for the troops. From the troops' point of view, the spectacle looks different. There's something harsh in his fellow Americans, avid, ecstatic, a burning that comes from the <coughs> deepest need, the narrator says, of Billy Lynn's thoughts. That's his sense of it. They all need something from him. This pack of half-rich lawyers, dentists, soccer moms, and corporate VPs, they're all mashing for a piece of a barely grown grunt making $14,800 a year. In short, Fallow suggests the salute to the hero's gestures do more for the civilian public self-esteem than for the troops. Fallow's point is that all this adulation is quite counterproductive and not really remotely in the best interest of the troops, a symptom of what he calls the chicken hawk nation, the term he uses to describe those eager to go to war as long as someone else is going. His thesis is that the Chicken Hawk Nation is made possible by a dangerous disconnection between the American public and its military, of which the thank you for your service rituals are a paradoxical symbol that replaces America's traditional, supportively critical engagement with the military. The result is that the American public no longer holds the military accountable for results. It blindly accepts what it gets. It is a blindness that was inconceivable in our country through the 1950s, the decade when Dwight Eisenhower, the former Allied Supreme Commander and President of the United States, warned the American public of the danger of what he called the military-industrial complex. In those days, something like 10% of the entire population was serving in the military on active duty. At least three quarters of us born before 1955 had an immediate family member serving in the military. But for millennials, it is less than a third. When we were invested in it personally, Fallows points out, most Americans were familiar enough with the military to respect it while being sharply aware of its shortcomings, as they were with the school system, their religion, and other important and fallible institutions. That is no longer true. What makes this dangerous is that because Americans suffer few personal consequences from today's military failures, as evidenced by the fact that a telegram and visit from a chaplain has been replaced by a personal call from the President of the United States. There are just too few of us who have a personal stake in demanding accountability for the use of military force. As the father of senior Chief Petty Officer Ryan Owens, <coughs> the SEAL killed in the Yemen raid in January, recently did. And so as surprising as it is with hundreds of generals deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan, during the longest period America has ever been at war, not one, not one, has been removed for ineffectiveness. This is so despite the reality that our all-volunteer troops who are better trained, equipped, motivated, and disciplined that at any time in our history are regularly defeated by less modern, worse equipped, and barely funded enemies. By contrast, civilian leadership in the Civil War, which was America's bloodiest war, with between 650,000 and 700,000 deaths, nearly 2% of the entire country, 
regularly fired generals precisely because they were not getting the job done. So what's going wrong? What's going wrong is that no one is paying attention. No one cares enough to demand effectiveness, results, and success, and insist on accountability when they are not achieved. The way Ryan Owen's father, who dared to question the circumstances of his son's death, did. The rest of us, those without the personal stake our ancestors had in the military's effectiveness, are too afraid and have difficulty overcoming that fear precisely because we lack the investment of the Owens family. We are too afraid of phantoms in the mountains of Afghanistan and monsters in the deserts of Syria and Iraq to dare something so unpatriotic as to question the military. So we do not criticize the military and we send surges of troops and expensive equipment when being critically supported is exactly what the military needs in order to learn from its mistakes. Fear, anxiety, keeps us from being self-critical enough to accomplish our goals and makes the emergence of the well different, differentiated leadership we need just that much more difficult to raise up. It keeps our leadership moving diagonally instead of directly, reflectively and responsibly, like they did when Americans felt enough pain to pay attention however necessary it may have realized that pain to be. Now, as you've already guessed, I spend so much time on that because I think it has quite a bit to do with the church, an institution perhaps even more beset by fear about its survival because of decline than is, than is the American public because of terrorism. From the Atlantic's insightful pondering of the systemic challenges to our mil military, I turn to The Living Church, a publication which is a nuclear reactor of anxiety production. <laughs> the Episcopal Church requires congregations to, mit to submit something called the Annual Parochial Report to measure attendance, membership, and giving. The numbers are collected, studied, and published, and forgotten. In November 2015, the Living Church published an analysis by da Dallas priest Neil Michelle. First, the facts. In the five years between 2010 and 2014, the Episcopal Church closed 241 churches, 48 per year. <laughs> lost 189,000 members, 38,000 per year. Decreased by 82,000 in average Sunday attendance, <laughs> 16,000 fewer than each year. Decreased its median attendance from an already alarming 65 to 60. Now, giving remains stable, even increasing slightly, until you account for inflation, after which it was <coughs> by about 1% overall. Now, still, just parenthetically, I think there's some good news there in that what may be happening is that the most committed people are remaining. After all of the 180,000 member loss, it appears that the vast majority of them didn't come to begin with. $189,000 loss in membership. As one, uh, over every five years, as one particularly cynical observer of the Episcopal Church has noted, would mean that we will completely disappear in 26 years. Now, he said that in 2011, so I only have 20 years. <laughs> 
and I'm pretty sure the church pension fund will survive, so what do I care? <laughs> now, unfortunately, Father Michel doesn't provide much analysis. One of the major causes for the loss uh, was dioceses that left the church as part of our conflict around sexuality issues. But that accounts for only half of the loss. The author speculates that the rest has to do with a number of things that he doesn't like, but he provides no evidence of that. And so I'm suggesting that he run for higher office. <laughs> Michelle is right though that the resource allocation does not reflect that reversing this trend is a very high priority, even if hand-wringing about it is. There are no compiled statistics about this for the local level, strangely enough. But at the church-wide level, membership is not a priority other than for the act of measuring. 42% of the church-wide budget is spent on administration and governance. Evangelism and form formation accounts for 18%. Subsidizing local efforts largely through ineffective, dependency creating, and ultimately unsustainable grants is 21%. Now, the last General Convention of the Episcopal Church set aside nearly $6 million, which it took from reserves rather than current revenue, by the way. And that's part of the 18% I just mentioned. 5% of the budget over three years, which is part of that 18%. What's disturbing though, is that the general convention itself costs <laughs> twice that amount of money over 10 days. There's no accountability. And the reason it seems to me is the same as Fallow's analysis of the military. No one is paying attention, only it's worse. When it comes to the church, not only is no one paying attention, no one cares. Of the almost two million Episcopalians who, who are left, how many of them, I wonder, have a clue about what goes on at the General Convention? Episcopalians are involved at the parish level where they should be involved. They may be vaguely aware that there is something called a diocese. It always amused me as a diocesan bishop that people talked about whether we were in communion with the Archbishop of Canterbury. As if the people in the pews knew who the Archbishop of Canterbury was. They didn't know who I was. <laughs> but I wanted to know the Archbishop of Canterbury. If they know about the diocese, they consider it an annoyance at best. And they know even less about the church-wide level, about governance structures, about the House of Deputies or the House of Bishops and about what goes on at church headquarters if they know there is a church headquarters at all. Now, all that being true, at the last General Convention of 2015, a very quick review on my part found that the convention had spoken to the government about the following topics. In some cases, directing that copies of the relevant re resolutions be submitted to the members of Congress and the President. The topics included, the UN Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Temporary Protective Status to Immigrants Fleeing Abuse, Permanent Birthright Citizenship, and that one was directed to the national governments of the 17 countries that make up the Episcopal Church, Advocacy for Policy Changes to End Mass Incarceration Practices, Support of Government Funding of Social Safety Net Programs, Balancing Federal Budget Priorities to Alleviate Poverty, an end to the Cuban embargo, reconciliation and restorative justice in the Middle East, peace in Sudan and South Sudan, subsistence rights of indigenous cultures, advocate, advocating for the poor and hungry, human rights and refugee relief in Central America, civil rights for disabled persons, support for the Church of Pakistan against persecution, violence and peace in Syria, Immigration assistance for youth and parents, Dominicans of Haitian descent, prison conditions and assistance to undocumented persons. Newsflash, no one is paying attention to what we have to say about those things, not even us. No one cares 
what the Episcopal Church has to say about the embargo of Cuba. It is very much like the welcome home rituals about which Fallows speaks. It makes us feel better to do it. <clears throat> and as much as I agree with what was stated in all of those resolutions, what I wonder about is how they distract us from actually doing something by talking about something. I remember one of my colleagues at the church center one time talking about ecumenical relations said, the talk is the work. No, it's not. The talk is the talk. To paraphrase Fallows, all these gestures do more for our sense of self-righteousness than they do to further the righteousness, to further righteousness in the world. And the talk has become a substitute for doing. C.S. Lewis's screw tape would be proud. <laughs> among our greatest fears and distractions is the absence among us of those who were born after 1980, the elusive millennials. Now, I am not a believer that millennials are really all that different from everybody else, except perhaps for their ability to be the object of our anxiety and to provide free tech support for their grandparents. <laughs> Even the anxiety that it carries <coughs> to young adults of today is really pretty much the same as it has always been, regardless of whether the youngest age group of young adults is the millennials, the Gen Xers, or the baby boomers. But for the moment, millennials have the focus, are the focus. And we are very anxious about them and why they don't come to church. Witness this assessment by Rachel Held Evans, an Episcopalian and author of Searching for Sunday, Loving, Leaving, and Finding the Church, in an op-ed piece for the Washington Post on April 30, 2015. Church attendance has plummeted among young adults. In the United States, 59% of people ages 18 to 29 with a Christian background have at some point dropped out. According to the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life, among those of us who came of age around the year 2000, a solid quarter claim no religious <laughs> affiliation at all. Just parenthetically, we now have a name for them. We call them nuns, not N-U-N-S, which is how I heard it to begin with, but N-O-N-E-S, no affiliation. Quarter claim no affiliation at all making my generation significantly more disconnected from faith than members of Generation X were at a comparable point in their lives and twice as detached as baby boomers were as young adults. And she goes on to describe the gimmicks churches like to use to attract young adults, like rock bands and live tweeting during the service, whatever that is, a coffee bar, a sleek church logo, an impressive technology, edgy programming, and my personal favorite, the giving away of an iPad at the end of the service. <laughs> Baby boomers, it seems, prefer windows. <laughs> Millennials are looking for putting the teachings of Jesus in practice, says Evans. And that makes them, well, pretty much like everyone else. I don't think that is at all unique to Millennials, but I confess it is where I first learned the reality. When I lived in Lexington, I used to go to a barber shop near the University of Kentucky campus called Kentucky Wild Cups. It's pretty catchy. <laughs> it makes you wonder about it, whether you should go in or not. Well, you know, even I have to go to the barber every once in a while. <laughs> and I would, so I would go to Kentucky Wildcats, and I was by far a wild cut. I was by far the oldest person I ever saw in there. The barbers were millennials and their customers were their friends and a steady stream of college students. I guess I enjoy having my hair cut by somebody with a tattoo and an earring. Anyway, they did a good job and their conversa conversation kept me eternally entertained. I would generally stop by during weekday work hours 
So I was almost always dressed in clerical attire, complete with purple shirt and plastic collar. My barber, whose name was Ryan, was not all that up on church, but he did recognize that the funny collar meant I was a priest. This is because he also cut the hair of a Catholic priest in town who I happen to know. So whenever I went in, that was Ryan's opportunity to quiz me about church. Now, for a long time, all he ever wanted to talk about was celibacy. I think he found the idea both incredibly quaint and beyond rational explanation. As do I, by the way. Or should I say, BTW. <laughs> I tried to explain to Ryan that not all priests were celibate and that celibacy was not exactly my area of expertise. No matter. He seemed really curious about it, and it was where he always began the conversation. All that changed one day, shortly after the earthquake in Haiti. On a day I happened to need a haircut, the Lexington Herald leader had run an article about conditions in Haiti and happened to mention the phenomenon of dirt cakes. A clump of dirt held together by cooking oil that relieves hunger even if it has no nutritional value, which is not an unusual practice in Haiti. As I sat down in Ryan's barber chair, he did not ask me about celibacy that day. Instead, he asked, did you know that people in Haiti eat dirt? Now, as a matter of fact, I did know that people in Haiti ate dirt, and I told him that, and I told him how I knew. And I told him that I had been to Haiti many times, and that the Diocese of Lexington <laughs> was engaged in work in Haiti, including building homes. In fact, I had a trip to Haiti coming up, and I invited Ryan and the other Barbie, barber to go with me as my guests. And they seemed interested, but that never happened. Still, it changed everything. The next time I went to get a haircut, things were completely different. I sat down in Ryan's chair. He placed the barber vestments around my neck, and he turned the chair around so that my back and his were turned away from the rest of the shop. And he proceeded to make his confession. Now, he didn't call it a confession, but he poured out his life story to me. We never discussed celibacy again. I wonder what would have happened if I had brought up the Episcopal version of celibacy instead of talking about building homes. I'm sure he would have been fascinated to know the latest resolutions on Haiti passed by the General Convention. Now, back to the military briefly. Fallow spent some time with Massachusetts, Massachusetts Congressman Seth Moulton, a veteran of the Iraq War, and having been born in 1978, a near millennial. It is interesting to me that Moulton made the same point explicitly that Ryan made implicitly. Moulton told Fallows that the main thing he learned from his tours in Iraq is the importance of service. Most interesting of all is that he credits this insight to his college chaplain, the late Peter Gomes, who taught him that it's not enough to believe in service. You should find a way yourself to serve. And so Moulton says his goal is to promote a culture where more people want to serve. I don't think he means the military necessarily. I think he just means somehow. That is why the organization I work with, Love Must Act, exists. I had to get a plug in for Love Must Act. This is it. It exists to bring people into relationship around a common concern and a common service, which in our case 
is building schools for poor children. It could be anything. It looks like getting out of your head, but it's really not getting out of your head at all. It's getting out of the brainstem in your head and maybe encouraging something a little more sophisticated than a limbic system response to challenge. And I have stuff about love must act up here for you. <laughs> there are times when the regressive effects of chronic anxiety in secular society can be mitigated by humor. Granted, it could be my particular sense of humor, but I have not found that humor works terribly well in church. Religion is, I'm afraid, an inherently serious business. Like the altar guild member I had who refused to take the leftover bread and wine and put it in the tabernacle. I think she'd seen Raiders of the Lost Ark one too many times. <laughs> and I didn't point that out to her because I'm pretty sure she wouldn't have thought it was funny at all. We may say that God has a strange sense of humor, but we don't really believe that. And we behave accordingly. In fact, introducing humor into the equation in church, while it may separate the teachable from the not, is rarely helpful and often makes religious people just get more serious. Witness the attack in Paris on the magazine Charlie Hebdo because of what was perceived as a joke about the prophet Muhammad. Witness the fatwa against Salman Rushdie. Witness the protests against a Danish newspaper that printed a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad. And it is not just Muslims. Witness the vitriol of Franklin Graham, the son of the venerable Billy Graham, on any number of subjects. Most recently, a Disney cartoon with an apparently gay character or the sarcasm, which is the inarticulate attempt to be humorous, of Pat Robertson's commentary on the 700 Club. The bigger danger sign for Christians is how the humor around us in the secular world has moved to pointing out our utter irrelevance in the world of which we are a part. The television show Mash's portrayal of Father Mulcahy comes to mind. The only antidote I have found that works consistently is the one to which Moulton alluded, the service of others. But it cannot be theoretical. It must be relational. It must be in the flesh. <clears throat> and if there's a little playing involved, so much the better which is why working with children is such a handy thing to do. In my mind, this gets at the essence of what pastoral care is really about. I once came back from a clergy conference in which there had been some issue that caused tension in a discussion with the clergy. I have no recollection whatsoever what it was. But what is interesting to me is that the dean of the cathedral made an appointment to come see me in the couple of weeks after the conference. My suspicion is that she was the one who drew the short straw and had to go to the lion's den to speak to the bishop. The clergy need you to be more pastoral, she said. The clergy don't need me to be pastoral, I replied. They need me to be clear. A challenge for leadership in the church is that the currency of authority is niceness and not responsibility. The preference for niceness, which is understood as being synonymous with pastoral, tends to be attributed to Jesus of all people. That might be right if by Jesus we mean the clean, smiling man with children in his lap which would not be allowed today under safe church policies, looking down from the Sunday school room wall. It does not, however, resemble Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Bible 
<laughs> talked back to his parents at age 12 when they found him in the temple, told the crowd in Nazareth that their stubbornness made him prefer Gentiles, told a Gentile woman that she was no better than a dog, compared divorced people to adulterers, taught people about the goodness of God by comparing them to the evil of those who were listening to him, did not hesitate to call people sinners, hypocrites, false teachers, and faithless, said he came not to bring peace but conflict and to set families against each other, told a man who wished to fulfill his filial responsibility and bury his father that he was not fit for the kingdom of God, wasn't much for family values in saying that one who loves father or mother, son or daughter more than Jesus is not worthy of him. Denied his mother and brothers when they came to him out of concern for his mental well-being. Compared his closest friend to Satan and had a physically violent temper tantrum in the, in the temple. On the other hand, the Jesus of the Bible certainly knew how to have a good time. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. And they say, look, glutton, and a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. In other words, the most religious people got all serious. The antidote was not niceness. It was clarity and action. Pastoral care has become confused in the church's mind with making people feel better. When it seems to me, it is really much more about helping people grow up. And even more about growing up oneself, which makes it easier for other people to grow up. Of course, concentrating on your own growing up would be selfish, which is the ultimately not nice thing to be. Ed Friedman, with whom I studied, and I'm so grateful for that opportunity, used to illustrate this point by recalling a sermon he had heard preached by someone who had been to the Holy Land and observed shepherds working for the first time. Sometimes the preacher said, the shepherd will talk to the sheep. Sometimes he said, the shepherd will pick up the sheep and carry it. <coughs> but mostly they beat their asses. Being a shepherd is not about being nice at all. Being a sheep is about getting cheered, eaten, or sacrificed, unless a wolf gets you first, which is what the shepherd is there to prevent. There is a corollary principle that complicates leadership in the church, and it is the failure to understand what compassion means. In the church's mind, it means to alleviate suffering. That's nice. But that is not what compassion means. Compassion comes from a compound of two Latin words, cum, which means with, and passio, which means to suffer. Compassion means to suffer with, to suffer with someone. For Christians, it is a shorthand of what God was up to in the Incarnation. God, after all, did not take our suffering away in Jesus. What God elected to do was to share the suffering with us, which though perhaps not as nice, is ultimately where the shepherd and the sheep find the connection. Related this, to this is the principle of church leadership that is very popular, but not at all effective. It is the principle of making decisions by consensus, which means that everyone in the group must agree before any action can be taken, which is utterly antithetical to responsibility. As Friedman would put it, consensus decision-making is allowing the most dependent members of the group to call the shots. He might have said weaker rather than stronger, the less capable rather than the more capable. Recently, I read that the senior management group at the Episcopal Church headquarters has elected 
to use consensus decision making as a tool. This I fear will not contribute to effectiveness or accountability. It will not promote responsibility. It will make people feel better, at least for a while, but it is likely to make progress impossible. Effectiveness and accountability result from the three-legged stool of leadership, responsibility, authority, and power. Take away one of the legs of the stool and leadership becomes unstable. I learned this from thinking through an exercise I participated in during a training for mentors in an education program. We went outside and were instructed to form a circle facing inward with our fingertips touching, which we sheepishly did. Breaking the connection between our touching fingertips was forbidden, as was communicating verbally. And with those limitations, the goal of the exercise was for each of us to pick a spot on the field to which we wanted to move the circle and then proceed to accomplish that movement. So we began. At first, the circle moved, well, like a circle with a couple steps one way or a couple of steps the other way. Being able, unable to break the con <clears throat> connection kept us pretty much in the same spot, no progress. The necessity of maintaining the connection became a hindrance to making progress. Now I enjoyed this game because eventually I re realized it was a laboratory for testing systems things. I'm not sure the person running the exercise realized that. And I remember one of Friedman's fables, my favorite one, the one about a man on a bridge holding onto a rope, at the end of which was another man pleading with the man on the bridge not to let go. It occurred to me that it might be possible to shift the burden of staying connected from myself to everyone else. So my strategy was to lunge toward my desired destination, forcing the people I was touching to follow me. It worked, at least sort of. I never got all the way to where I was trying to get, but I did get closer. The first leg of the leadership stool is responsibility. Somebody has got to be responsible for something. It could be more than one somebody's. In fact, it usually is, and the level of responsibility need not be uniform. But responsibility has to reside somewhere. Second, authority. Authority is an organic quality that follows responsibility. Any other attribution of authority is artificial. Any other source of authority is illusory because it depends on being recognized. The authority that comes from responsibility comes not from the acknowledgement of others, but from the leader's own sense of self, the leader's own sense of being responsible, his or her acceptance of the reality that the buck stops here, which like Harry Truman, my boss, presiding bishop, Catherine Jeffrey Shorey, kept on her desk at all times. And then there's the third leg, which is power. In the church world, power is a bad word. Now, for sure, power can be abused, but it can be abused only if it is disconnected from the other two legs of the stool, from responsibility and authority. Likewise, if the power leg of the stool is taken away, responsibility and authority cannot be exercised. Or maybe it's just that they become irrelevant. Power is the means to accomplishment. Without power, authority cannot be exercised and responsibility cannot be discharged. I may have the responsibility to provide light in a dark room which in turn gives me the, the authority to turn on the lamp. 
but without access to the power of electricity, I'm out of luck. Power is not an inherent negative. It is value neutral at worst. Why then do systems, and certainly the church, constantly seek to shut power down? It's called, of course, sabotage. One thing I did not mention about the exercise of moving the circle around is that after I had tried the lunge maneuver a couple of times, thereby exercising power, the others in the group caught on and I began to experience resistance. My power, which came from not having to tell everybody what I was doing, got turned off. Or maybe it was I forgot to pay the bill. <laughs> I think it is because people quite understandably fear the exercise of power because it is subject to misuse. As Lord Acton reminded us, of course, it corrupts, sometimes absolutely. Likewise, access to electricity is not without its danger, particularly without gr grounding, circuit breakers, switches, and insulation, <coughs> it can be deadly. Harnessing power, appropriate regulation of power, as long as we have con confidence in the regulation, overcomes the fear of the use of power and allows it to work to accomplish something. The implication of that, I think, is a further leadership principle the church has a particularly difficult time with. It has to do with the concept of trust and the reality that trust is a dependent word. It is the lack of trust not the presence of trust that allows progress to be made. Don't worry, I'm going to explain to you what I mean by that. Now, most church leaders I know would tell you exactly the opposite, that the absence of trust is what has gone wrong. But I think this is exactly backwards. I once was being lectured by another bishop about the importance of trust for the well-being of the church. Really, I asked, what would trust look like? What would be signs that trust existed? Without hesitating, transparency, he said. But isn't transparency a tool that allows us not to trust? Or something that I want when I do not trust? It's like trust but verify. That's not really trust much. It's about being able to see what someone else is doing precisely because I don't trust them. Transparency is how to avoid the necessity of trusting. The conversation did not continue. I think it had gotten <coughs> entirely unnice. I regretted that because I had hoped to explain Plato's understanding of the guardians in the Republic text. Now the field of contract law, and many other laws too, exists so that strangers can engage in commerce or relationship without depending on trust. That's what allows business to take place at all, at least beyond a very small group. But even then, my guess, is that even in a small group where everyone knows each other well, there is a well-developed and extensive set of informal sanctions that diminish the absolute reliance on trust for things to be accomplished. Now, to be sure, there are some relationships that are more trust than they are law. The relationship between human beings and God, for example, is 100% trust at least on the human side. And maybe on God's too. We like to talk about God's trust in us as co-creators, which I think is probably heretical, as well as the steward of God's mission of reconciliation, which I think is orthodox. But after all, there is a large body of law about the consequences of disobedience or failure in those tasks. It is called the Bible. Now, 
parents and children relate mostly based on trust. Trust that proves itself over time, but is pretty close to pure at the relationship's beginning. When one party is completely dependent on the other. Healthy marriages have healthy doses of trust, of course. On the other hand, there are matrimonial laws for a reason. And one of the reasons is to diminish the absolute reliance on trust, at least about the economic consequences of the relationship. And there are laws that govern a parent's duty to care for a child, which admittedly do not work all that well. Now, I'm still thinking about this, but it may be that the relationship between friends comes closest to being based solely on trust. There may or may not be legitimate expectations, but there really is no legal recourse to diminish the necessity of trust. And that is true of the friendship aspects of marriage and of the parent-child relationship. Now, this is going to take a little further work on my part to recover anything I ever knew about Greek. But I'm wondering is whether the agape in the New Testament, the Greek Bible's word for the love due strangers, requires a legal framework, a constitution, a code, a covenant, to overcome the avoidable and well-founded lack of trust among strangers. It is worth noting that agape does not imply emotional content in the sense of feelings. Philia, the Greek word for the love among friends, does. That's why it makes sense to command agape, because it is subject to some regulation. And I don't think that is true of philia. Relationships with an emotional risk come down to trust and consequently dependency. The more economics enters the question, though, the more pure trust is, is required. <coughs> Which is why perhaps Jesus on the shore of the Sea of Galilee after the resurrection asks his best friend twice, do you agape me? and then concludes, do you fill you up? A, a related challenge for leadership, and this is certainly true of the church, although it is by no means restricted to the church, is what I like to call clearness thinking, which is quite a different thing than clarity. I first became aware of clearness thinking in my life as a lawyer, the first year of which I spent clerking for a federal judge, during which time I got to read a lot of briefs, and listen to a lot of oral arguments. And I noticed something that was interesting, which is the way lawyers use the word clearly, as in the law is clearly this, or the facts clearly show that. Rational people do not pay good money to lawyers to argue about things that are clear to begin with. <laughs> In fact, the very use of the word clear coming out of a lawyer's mouth suggests that whatever it is isn't clear at all. In fact, the more I started paying attention, the more I noticed that lawyers often betrayed their own perceived weakness and vulner vulnerability by covering it up with the word clearly. It was as if they thought they could pull the wool over everyone's eyes by asserting clearness when clearness did not exist. Now, I don't want to go into politics too much, but the next time you watch a White House press briefing, pay attention to that. <laughs> now, I have noticed the same phenomenon in the church, particularly in our conflicts over the last 20 years about sexuality, as in orthodoxy clearly demands, or the Bible clearly says, or justice clearly requires. Same principle. For the most, most part, both sides in those arguments are committed, intelligent, and faithful. So when people who are equally committed, intelligent, and faithful have an argument, it seems to me to be because nothing is 
really clear at all. It's just that when you use the word clearly, what you're doing is precipitating the cloud. The necessary implication of asserting that something is clear is that those who disagree with you are either so stupid that they cannot recognize what is clear, or so evil that they do not care what is clear. Now you can't really engage with somebody about a heresy, and you can't engage with somebody about injustice. So your only option is to cut off. And the story of the Episcopal Church in the last 15 years is the story of cut off and assigning the blame therefore, which has been all the other people's fault, by the way. That was supposed to be funny. Okay. What is tragic is the failure to see the opportunity for relationship was precisely in the lack of clarity or dare I say ambiguity, and that the, racial, the relational cutoff came in the clearness, the counterfeit clearness. So now if you would allow me to move beyond the church for a moment, I want to share with you one horrifying moment about clearness thinking in myself that could keep me up at night if I allowed it to. I noticed it not only all around me, but in myself as November the 8th of last year grew closer. It is crystal clear to me, crystal, that no one in their right mind could vote for Donald Trump. But then I noticed that there were people who are at least as intelligent as I, who love our country as much as I, and who are at least as good as I, who saw things exactly the opposite. I admit that I do not understand this. They, on the one hand, could not understand, on the other hand, could not understand how anyone of sound mind could vote for Hillary Clinton. And here is what is really scary. Among those who voted, Virtually 50% saw clearness one way, and the other 50% saw it exactly the opposite way. We as a country are almost equally divided about what is clear. Our greatest danger at the moment is cut off, not error, and not even corruption, and not even treason. Now, I'm certainly not comparing the incumbent to Abraham Lincoln, even if he does. But I have to wonder if the danger of cutoff, even violent cutoff, has been greater for us in this country at any time since 1860. What I'm not seeing is a great deal of evidence of anyone's better angels. What I don't know how to do is both deal with the issues at hand and accept that the answers are actually not all that clear. Or maybe it's just that half of us do not deserve to live. And that's what really scares me. <clears throat> now with that cheery thought in mind, let me close with one hopeful way of reality may emerge from the fact that bishops only move diagonally. I shared my amusement with the reality of how bishops move on a chessboard at a church meeting one time, my theme being not unlike tonight's, that moving diagonally is less likely to produce progress than moving directly. After all, bishops are disposable, queens are not. <laughs> After the talk, a sweet looking little old lady, the head I'm sure of someone's altar guilt, came up to tell me she thought I had that all wrong. I confess that I did not think she knew what she was talking about at first glance, which ought to have taught me something about judging books by their covers. She went on to tell me that she had learned from her, her daughter about roller derby. That's right, roller derby. Now, for the uninitiated, roller derby is a sport 
more than a little bit violent, with all of the credibility of professional wrestling, in which women roller skate around a track and knock each other down, preferably over the railing of the track. The sweet old lady's daughter played roller derby, and she had taught her mother that the secret power move in roller derby was paradoxically not to seek head-on confrontation, but to skate into the pack diagonally, because it was the diagonal movement that gave you the momentum to go ahead and knock all of the others off their wheels. Which leads me to wonder, maybe I've missed the point about moving diagonally all along, and that generations of my predecessors, predecessors, predecessors actually knew what they were doing after all. It turns out that there is more to the killer instinct in moving diagonally than I had realized. You just have to know when to do it. That's, now I hope we can have some conversation.